Part 1. Discovering. On April 28, 2004, Americans were stunned when CBS television broadcast those now notorious photographs from Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison, showing hooded Iraqis stripped naked while U.S. soldiers stood by smiling. As the scandal grabbed headlines around the globe, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld insisted the abuses were, quote, perpetrated by a small number of U.S. military, whom the conservative New York Times columnist William Sapphire soon branded as creeps. When I looked at that most iconic photo of a hooded Iraqi with fake electrical wires hanging from his extended arms, I saw not the sadism of a few creeps, but instead the two key trademarks of the CIA's psychological torture paradigm. The hood was for sensory disorientation. The arms were extended for self-inflicted pain. It was that simple. It was that obvious. By using the past to interrogate the present, I published a book titled The Question of Torture last year that tracks the trail of an extraordinary historical and institutional continuity through countless pages of leaked and declassified documents. I found that from 1950 to 1962, the CIA led a secret research effort to crack the code of human consciousness, a veritable Manhattan project of the mind with costs that reach at peak in the late 1950s, a billion dollars a year. Now, many, if not all of us, have heard about the most outlandish and least successful aspect of this research, the testing of LSD on unsuspecting <coughs> subjects and the tragic death of a CIA employee, Dr. Frank Olson, who jumped, or as his son now believes, was pushed to his death from a New York hotel after a dose of this drug. This agency drug testing, the focus of countless sensational stories and investigative reports, led nowhere except to lawsuits by the victims of Dr. Ewan Cameron's sadistic experiments at McGill's Allen Memorial Institute, lawsuits that still continue today, 45 years after these experiments ended. Now, in scientific terms, this vast CIA experiment <clears throat> yielded the sorts of negative results that real scientific labs across the world produce very quietly countless times every day. That's to say, negative results. But obscure CIA-funded <coughs> behavioral experiments outsourced to leading Canadian and American universities produced some key findings, all duly and rather dully reported in scientific journals that contributed to the discovery of a distinctively American form of torture, psychological torture. This behavioral approach was given real impetus by a secret <coughs> American, British, Canadian research effort launched in May 1951 when Sir Henry T. Tizard, the venerable senior scientist from the UK Ministry of Defense, <coughs> flew across the Atlantic and checked into Montreal's Ritz-Carlton Hotel taking a single room with bath. In 1940, Sir Henry had crossed the Atlantic to forge cooperation from allied physicists that made radar a key weapon in the defeat of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan during World War II. Now, 11 years later, in 1951, Sir Henry was making the same voyage across the same ocean to mobilize this time not physicists but behavioral scientists for the fight against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. In 1986, a Canadian government inter inquiry headed by George Cooper Cousy reported, quote, a high-level meeting took place at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Montreal on June 1st, 1951, attended by Dr. Oman Salant, head of Canada's Defense Research Board, Dr. Donald O'Hebb, head of the board's behavioral research and chair of psychology at McGill University, and two Americans, Dr. Carol Haskins and Commander R.J. Williams, who were identified in a handwritten note later found in the files of the Defense Research Board as CIA. Indicative of the extent of CIA penetration of the US scientific establishment during this era, Dr. Carol Haskins became, just five years later, president of the influential Carnegie Institution of Washington, DC, a position he held until 1971. As noted in the minutes of the <clears throat> meetings taken by the Defense Research Board, quote, Dr. Hebb suggested that an approach based on upon the situation of sensory isolation might lead to some clues to answering the central problem which interested this group, this covered research coalition. Quote, confession, menticide, intervention in the individual mind together with methods concerned in psychological coercion, end quote. In response to Dr. Hebb's statement, Sir Henry, Sir Henry Tizard, stated that these issues, quote, have become a matter of concern in the UK, and his advisors had pointed out, quote, that methods of psychological coercion had been well developed by the Inquisition. In framing a research agenda to explore the psychological coercion practice in the Inquisition and the Salem witch trials, the group agreed that sensory isolation might place subjects, quote, in such 
a position psychologically that they would be susceptible to the implantation of new or different ideas. Consequently, the Defense Research Board gave Dr. Hebb a confidential grant for this research, which discovered by August 1954 that, quote, mere isolation not involving any physical punishment might be a most powerful instrument for affecting fundamental changes in individual beliefs. Hinting at continuing CIA contacts, this work, Dr. Salant explained in a later report, has been of, quote, appreciable interest to US research agencies, representatives of which have, by arrangement, visited Hebb. Elaborating upon the meaning of this so-called arrangement, Cooper's report explained that Washington and Ottawa had agreed that if a Canadian scientist such as Hebb had work of interest to the CIA, he would do the work as directed by the United States, but be paid from Canadian funds by Ottawa, thus making Hebb a de facto CIA researcher. <clears throat> Although the Canadian inquiry portrayed these behavioral experiments as a desperate search for defense against communist brainwashing, the CIA's own minutes of the meeting make it clear that this was not, in fact, the case. As these discussions open, the principals, according to the CIA minutes, quickly agreed that there was, quote, no conclusive evidence that the Soviets had made anything akin to revolutionary progress and dismissed their interrogation techniques as, quote, remarkably similar to the age-old methods. Behind closed doors, therefore, the defensive pretense for this cruel science evaporated, and these cold warders decided to pursue control over human consciousness for its own sake, agreeing on joint research for their own offensive Cold War operations, a decision I would argue that raises serious questions about the sincerity of their stated anti-communist uh, motives and the possibility of indeed darker, darker motivations. Within just a few years, this mind control effort would include a British intelligence research unit at Sussex, an Anglo-American facility, CIA and MI6 near Frankfurt for fatal experiments on captured Soviet bloc expendables, uh, CIA-funded psychology research at leading universities, periodic allied conferences to exchange results, and above all, classified Canadian studies of sensory deprivation at McGill University. Indeed, in 1951-52, the CIA coordinated the US intelligence community in developing a special top secret interrogation program to explore ways that, to quote a CIA document, medical science, <clears throat> particularly psychiatry and psychotherapy, has developed various techniques by means of which some external control can be imposed on the mind or will of an individual such as drugs, hypnosis, electric shocks, and neurosurgery, with the aim of evaluating the extent of threat to the national security of the United States. In September of 1951, just three months after this Montreal meeting, Dr. Henry K. Beecher, professor of anesthesiology at Harvard University, crossed the Atlantic to troll European universities and the US intelligence community in Europe for collaborators and an exploration of the efficacy of true serum, mescaline, and LSD-25 for interrogation. Remember the name Henry K. Beecher, if you don't know it already, because we'll be coming back to him at the conclusion of this talk. <clears throat> Although pursued vigorously at CIA headquarters and a half dozen university research hospitals for a decade, all this drug research was a dead end in the CIA's search for new interrogation methods. 